Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. I know this is the first session. You hear me? Good? Yeah. Um, the first session, the second day, So, and there are other presentations going on, so I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. So, um, let's get started with this. So, let's go to introduction. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I didn't know how this was going to go, so I, I'm introducing myself a second time. Uh, my name is Leila mires Kandari. I'm the founder and director of Kids Growing City. Um, my focus is to change the world one school garden at one kids garden at a time because I have two different things that I'm doing with this. I'll tell you in a moment. And yes, I do have a definition of kids garden. Um, so I'm doing this by teaching parents how to grow um, kids gardens at home and at the same time teaching teachers how to grow successful and sustainable school gardens. And these are two very different things, like home gardens and school gardens are two very different things. Um, can I see by show of hands how many teachers do we have here? Okay, awesome. And uh, from health? Awesome. And other people? <laughs> okay. Can I ask what's your role? What I just want to have an idea of. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Thank you. And you? Um, I work with uh, Ministry of Okay, amazing. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, okay, so yeah, these two are very different, and there are a lot of differences between these two and community gardens as well. Um, but if you have children in community gardens, then this would be useful, obviously. All right, so as... as was said already, I have a master's degree in environmental studies, uh, environmental and sustainability education diploma from York University, uh, business and the, environment, and the environment diploma as well from Schulich School of Business, and I'm a certified permaculture designer. So now um, you might be thinking, who cares, right? Those are all titles. Who are you really? And why should I sit here and listen to you? So I'm going to start over. My name is Leila Miris Kandari. I am a mother of two children, um, seven years old and 14. I am born in Iran. I came to Canada in 2001, 16 years ago, and both my kids are Canadian born, thank God. Um, and if you know a little bit about the history of Iran, yes, I was in a war as a child, um, eight years of my childhood. Um, went through a war, which we had with a neighboring country called Iraq. So, and I've been lucky, very lucky. Uh, nobody in my family was hurt by war. Um, and I was living in a middle-class family, so I was never poor. Uh, but I had, I've had the privilege of um, having um, friends in school, many of them, who were not as privileged or as lucky as I was. And uh, their main um, concern, um, you know, wasn't if the bombs were going to kill them that night, but if they were going to go hungry to bed again. Um, so, as you can imagine, I have seen with my own eyes the result of this type of mentality. The mentality that says um, resources are scarce, things like food and energy, and oil, and uh, people compete to get to them to the extent that they go to war and kill each other over it. Uh, so this is what I've seen essentially throughout my childhood. Um, but at the same time, I grew up in an ancient culture of love, peace, abundance, and empathy. Um, reading poetry uh, from poets such as Rumi, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them, with him, the, who says things like, the wound is the place where the light enters you. Or, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean in a drop. The idea of abundance. Um, or, tolerance. 
out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I will meet you there. Or poets like Sadi, who says, human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you've no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. And this is in the United Nations wall, actually written. I came to Canada with this mentality, thinking, although my culture was really, you know, filled with love and peace and all that, but what I have actually experienced as a child was exactly the opposite throughout the society and between countries. And thinking about the whole world, this is what the mentality I came to Canada with, meaning that I was thinking, um, yes, it was like a war area, that I, and I came to a country that was peaceful, which was really, really good. That's why I came here. Uh, I wanted my children, future children, to actually be born in a country that they didn't have to go through what I had to go through, because in my opinion, it was completely unnecessary. Uh, but I came with the idea, oh, there's, no, that's, that's correct. Sorry, I thought I had a misspelling there. Um, that there's no one who can fix this world. There is nothing you can do to fix this. This is way too screwed up. Sorry about the language. And it's just not, no politics or religion can fix this. And my experience with policy and religion was the extreme type, which completely made me have no faith in any of those two, um, unfortunately. So that's the mentality I came in with until I became a mother. So what I was thinking, I was thinking, okay, there's nothing I can do in this world, meaning that I have to take care of me and me only and my immediate family and that's it, it because what's the point, right? There's, there's nothing that I as one person can do to fix anything in this world. It's way too bigger than me. It's way too messed up. There's no way. And then I became a mother and I could no longer ignore the problems in this world because my culture was telling me that this world is all connected and we're all one. And if there's things that are going wrong in some somewhere else, it's going to come back and bite me at the end of the day because the world is all connected. Anyway, but life went on. Um, so I had a bachelor's degree from back, back home in applied mathematics. Um, and I was in computer development, so I worked in software development for 15 years of my life. Um, uh, and then um, I had my second daughter, which you saw the picture of. Um, and I went to math leave and I joined Facebook because I don't know uh, if, if, if you guys have kids, but the first child comes and you're like, ah, I'm so ready. And then sure he comes and you're like, oh, I was so not ready. Right? It, it, it's hard work and it's just, uh, anyway, it's, it's tough. And then the second child comes and you're like, okay, now I know what I'm dealing with. So I actually set up a bed in her room because I was like, there is no way, there's, there's not going to be any sleep. This is the way it's going to be. So, and I joined Facebook to entertain myself throughout those, you know, sleepless nights. And through Facebook, I came uh, across permaculture. Now, I'm not going to get into what permaculture is to bore you with any of the, the that jargon, but it, it is what I was looking for. The solution that is not politics, that is not religion, that is filled with peace and love and uh, abundance and the idea that of empathy and all of that, which we, which I was looking for, which I saw throughout my childhood in my culture and poetry and and, and art in my country. Anyway, so uh, permaculture has three ethics, earth care, people care, and fair share, and it has 12 principles, which which um, is actually what I use in my school gardens, but again, and there's a lot of techniques, you know, hands-on practical techniques that helps you apply these principles and um, ethics. And then I came across like I, so I started reading and, you know, digging deep into permaculture. What is it? You know, book after book and article after article and video after video. Um, I'm going to show you a small. Hi, I'm Bill Mollison. I sometimes get very sick of bad news. 
And I think we should always look at things like that and try to turn it into good news. It's really easy to turn things around. In five weeks' time, this will be a nice set of potatoes. And for me, that's good news. So, I don't know if you can hear him. So, he's essentially putting a potato in a proper setting um, by design so that that potato can, can turn. And he's putting it in a newspaper filled with bad news. And from where I ca came from, like I was like, yes! This is what I've been looking for. And it's, it's not, it wasn't just this video. Trust me, I did my research. I've been, you know, I just wanted to show you this very small clip because this was the moment that I said, this is it. This can really help. This can really change the world in a small way. Um, okay, Bill Mollison. That's, that's the guy who just, who you just saw. Um, and, I really love the idea of turning bad news into good news because the, the, we, we have to start doing this. Um, and it felt like home. It felt like I'm, I'm back into the culture of abundance and love and empathy and uh, tolerance um, and that I find, finally found the solution that I could dedicate my life to without feeling yucky and icky. Like politics was something, for example, that I totally felt yucky and icky about at that point in time. I'm like, okay, so um, grassroots. So I can do very small things by, for example, growing my own food in my garden and teaching other people to do that. So I started to grow my own food at home and following permaculture principles, which makes it a lot easier because you're not fighting with nature, you're actually working with nature to get the result that you want. You essentially invite nature in a design, um, in a proper design that it helps you. All the energy that comes to your place, like wind and sun and water that could, in a bad design situation, actually destroy and, and create destructions. If you put it in proper design, which I was learning uh, through permaculture, it can actually be helpful and useful. You can actually put it in, in, in good use to help you uh, grow your own food. Um, and I started thinking, why was I not taught about this? Bill Morrison is, has died. It's, it's, it's no thing. And this idea of permaculture, he called it permaculture, but he didn't invent it. This is an ancient way of living and, you know, working with nature. He actually collected this information from other places and tried it out. And so why was I not taught how to grow food was my question. Um, and I started looking at my older daughter's education, um, who was at that time going to first grade and in a private school at that point in time. And I was like, why isn't she being taught how to grow food? Um, why isn't she taught that she can, she does have the power to create abundance, at least in the area of food and energy for herself. And then I started looking at this and I'm like, okay, if her teachers are the same age as me, almost, more or less. They haven't been taught how to grow food either. And I thought about one generation back and two generations back. At least in my case, like if you guys have been lucky and you grew up in a farm or your parents grew up in the farm, maybe that's not the case for you. But most people have been skilled in this area for many, many generations. Like, not to point fingers at anybody. This is how we have evolved. This is how it has happened. And at this point in time, I really think that we have to bring the skills back. At least, like, so you can't expect teachers to all of a sudden start teaching this. There's no way they can do that because nobody taught them how to do it. They, they haven't been taught in through their education at, to become a teacher either. I approached my daughter's school and they had after school programs at that point in time, uh, like for ballet and uh, computers and chess and this and that. And I'm like, can I offer an after school program? And they were like, what do you want to teach? And I'm like, gardening. And their eyes shined. And at that moment, I knew I was up to something. She said, sure, we're going to offer it to parents because this was an after school program. They were supposed to pay for it. Um, and we'll see if they really like it or not. And we did, and it was really, really successful. Like we filled up the, the, the 
spot and we went into a, a wait list very quickly. And that told me that parents are feeling the same, I mean, similar to what I was feeling as a parent, that this is missing, this is really missing from uh, the education of our children. So uh, that private school had other branches. So at first I was thinking, well, maybe this was a fluke. Maybe it was just one time thing. Maybe the parents in this particular school are really excited about this. What about other places? So I went and offered this in the other branches um, of the same private school and again, success, success after success. My daughter, I moved her to a public school, offered it there, another success. My like parents love this. They are so passionate about it. And they really want this for their children, at, like majority of them, essentially. So, so while I was going doing that, obviously I was not a teacher at that point in time. And I was putting together curriculum, you know, doing my best. Um, I had experience with, with gardening, doing it the permaculture style at my home. So I was putting all that together and trying to do my best. But at the same time, I was getting familiarized, especially when I moved to public schools with teachers' pains and uh, how th their pain points. Like, I don't have enough time uh, for this. I don't have enough uh, energy for this. Um, um, it's going to be too much work for me. All those different types of myths. That, that are around the school garden, which are true if you do it the wrong way. Um, if you try to do it, uh, you know, fighting with nature and not, you know, ha you know, anyway. So I'm going to tell you all about the system that I used to. But I start like my curriculum started to evolve by, you know, listening to people, seeing what, what it is that they want. Um, I started making the curriculum connections to the Ontario curriculum, and which was really, really needed by, by the school teachers. They were like, okay, if I'm doing this, because at this point in time in the private school, I was doing it at the public school. I was doing it as an in-school program because that's what the principal wanted. She said, after school, never mind. Um, let's do it in school. Let's bring it in. Let's, let's involve three or four classes and let's teach a lot of kids and build a bigger school garden that they feel the ownership of. Because an after school program, and I have stopped doing after school programs, by the way, because um, it doesn't work the way I want it to work. It doesn't have the impact that it needs to have. Um, after school programs are paid by parents, usually the type that I was doing, and it's very expensive and uh, per child. And um, it's really limited because, like, it's like there's a cap of 15 kids, and then it goes to wait list, and they don't like you know it's 15 kids. When I go to a school for an in-school program, it's 80 kids, it's 100 kids that that I'm impacting, which is a huge difference to me. Um, and where was I? So I fine-tuned and fine-tuned my um, uh, program, and then at, in, in the in-school program, I started connecting it with the, the, the teachers' pains and you know trying to solve their problems and issues with uh, with this, and you know working with community and fine-tuning my lesson plans more and more according to the feedback I was getting from teachers. Again, feedback, feedback, feedback from teachers, from students actually anonymously in fun ways. Um, at the end of my programs, I would ask their feedback. What did you love about this program? What did you hate about it? What do you want to be added to it? And all of that. Uh, and admin staff as well. Like, were you okay? Did you, did you feel like there was any pressure on you? And, and all of those things. And I, it went on and on. And I fixed and fixed and fixed and got it better and better offered it to more and more schools. Now, um, at this point in time, you can imagine, I, so I, I had a full-time job. Uh, I was, at this point in time, I was a project leader of the software development team. I had a pager, which would go off sometimes three o'clock in the morning. I was raising two kids and I had two um, businesses. Well, this is one that I'm telling you about. I have another business turning people's lawns into food forests from a culture style, Never mind. But I, what I'm trying to tell you is that I started to get really, really crazy busy. That's a problem I have. Um, but I started offering it to more and more schools. And results were staggering. This is a keyhole garden. It's a permaculture technique, actually. And underneath it, uh, this wood. There's something called hugo culture. Fancy word for wood topped up with soil. Um, which is a uh, water conserving, uh, I don't want to get into this, water conserving and uh, soil building technique, 
Uh, if you have Google culture, then the wood starts to decay. That means you don't have to till. Air is always in your soil. There's many, many different, anyway, good things about doing these types of things. And I, happy kids, this is not hosed, by the way. Kids were actually standing there doing this. I was like, yay, that's a picture. <laughs> so, so I went and took the picture. Um, but it's like all kinds of examples of saving seeds, tons and tons of food, like th these carrots, we harvested them in fall when the kids came back. I have two programs, um, uh, one in spring and one in fall, it's a 10 weeks program that, yeah, anyway, I'll tell you all about that. Uh, food, more food, more success, like using whatever is there. So instead of, you know, buying a trellis and putting it there, again, permaculture says, use whatever you have. So there was this fence that was not adjacent to any other property. So we could go, this was actually street on the other side. So we could actually use this to, to grow happy principals, happy admin staff, happy teachers, on and on and on and on again. So again, my story, moves on, like I'm building those relationships. Um, I, and then I went and actually got my permaculture certificate. So um, I had a very good supportive boss and I went to him and I said, hey, I need all my vacation together because I'm going um, into this um, eco village and they're teaching permaculture and I need two weeks. And it has nothing to do with my work. I'm just letting you know, <laughs> please. So, and he was very supportive. So he did give me the vacation. So I went and I got my permaculture certificate. <laughs> that was not, okay. It came out totally wrong. <laughs> These two, at, yeah, I was talking about my boss being an awesome job. And I, that's not how quickly it happened. Okay. <laughs> it's not like I went to my permaculture certificate, came back and quit my job. No, it took a while because I was like, as I was telling you, it got really, really busy in my life. I was running two businesses. I was raising two kids and I had a full-time job that started to not make sense anymore. Um, you know, according to this other passion that I developed and, um, and it was busy like pager, you're waking up in the middle of the night and then doing what, like I remember going into like the office in the morning and the elevator doors would open and I would step in and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, like just on this floor, there is 300 people who are wasting their life doing a job they don't even like, like, which is not necessarily the case for all those people, but that was how I was feeling about my own job. Um, although I loved the people I was working with, loved my boss and all that, but I wasn't making the impact I wanted to make and I was working for a bank and sometimes I felt like I was actually doing harm more than I was doing good. Long story. Anyway, so um, where was I? So my boss moved on. So he sent an email and there was an announcement that he moved on to another job and they replaced him with another awesome guy, but totally new. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. Uh, at that point in time, I actually had convinced my boss, my old boss to, to give me two days to work from home because like with all the work that I, and this new job, a new boss wouldn't probably support that because he had no idea what uh, I was up to and if he knew he probably wouldn't support it because I, he would be like okay you need to you have a full-time job you have to focus on this what is this thing that you're doing out there that's taking all of your energy and mind and, and all that so I remember sitting at the kitchen table with my husband and just so frustrated and, and I'm like okay this isn't working I can't do this anymore and he's like okay let's sit down and go through our finances maybe maybe you can quit your job and I'm like Maybe I can. So we did, and I'm not, uh, we're not rich. Like, it's not like it was easy for me to say no to a almost six, six digit salary at that point in time with two kids and, um, and all that. My little one was going to private school. Anyway, um, but we decided that this is the thing to do. So that, that's, I had to fix that. Like, 
my job, my boss being so awesome, and boom, I quit my job. So I had to tell you the story. <laughs> Sorry for the long story. Yeah, so th that's how it happened, essentially. He moved on, and I, I, I had to move on because I didn't have the support that I needed anymore. And it was the right choice to do anyway because I was stretching myself way too thin, and it, which was not healthy for myself or my family. Anyway, um, so I started hiring teachers, training them to send them to the school because there were more and more schools that were interested in this and I wanted a successful and sustainable school garden in every school. I want this in the whole world because I really think that every child deserves to learn this amazing skill. Anyway, um, and then now that I didn't have a job to go to, I went to school. I told you I'm sick, so I create work for myself, right? Um, anyway, so I went to school to get my master's degree in environmental studies. Um, my husband, I'm so blessed and lucky, he works for York University, he's a professor there. So I could do this without paying, which was, yay, let me do that. Finances were tight, but this is free, so let me go and do this. And they have an amazing environmental studies program at York University, which is very multidisciplinary. It's, it's awesome. They were actually happy that my bachelor's degree is not related to this. They were like, okay, so let's bring the project management and computers and mathematics into this to, to solve the problems in the world, which is the skills that I brought into, you know, writing my curriculum and, you know, working with schools, because these are all projects. So the different type of project, but it's, there are skills that you can use from different, uh, Thanks. So um, what I do, did as part of my master's degree in environmental studies, I researched the obstacles in the way of school gardening. That was part of my research. So I did a major project, which was partly research, partly a project. And the project was that I built an online course called DCP School Gardening Formula. D DCP stands for DS Design, uh, C for curriculum, P for planning, because these are the three very important components that you have to have in a school garden for it to actually be successful and sustainable. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about DCP. It was praised by all my profs. Like, they loved it, right? I, I kept getting, you know, awesome feedback from them. This is amazing work, Leila. You should put this out there for the whole world. Teachers would love this, right? So I've got 15 teachers enrolled in it to get feedback from them. And these were teachers who were in the in-school programs that I was running on the ground. I'm like, okay, so I have this amazing course. My profs are really excited about it. Um, how about I enroll you and you go through it? So because when I used to go to my schools, I didn't tell you this, I was running my programs, but I was asking the teachers if they're interested in learning because I'm, I come from the abundance uh, mentality. I want this to be everywhere. I want to teach people so that they can replace me. I would like to go to other schools, more and more schools, and I would like to leave behind the schools that I worked in in a sustainable and successful way. And for that, we need teachers who know how to do this, right? So, and they were all shadowing me and learning from me and taking notes and all of that. So those were the, the teachers that I enrolled in, um, in the program. And none of them went through the course. I was like, what? What's going on here? Like, my profs were really proud of me. This is an amazing thing. What's going on? So I started asking them, hey, please tell me what's going on. Um, the, the teachers who shadowed me and did this on their own in the next um, spring were really successful. They were doing this like my system that I, that I was teaching in that course was working. The system itself works. The teachers who were um, trained on it, they do it and they do it successfully. So why is it that they don't want to learn online? So, and um, I, at that point in time, I started having in-person workshops, online shorter workshops, like three-piece workshops and, you know, or one-day workshop, and they were all successful. Yeah, you know, teachers would come and they would learn and they would leave excited and they would send me emails after when they actually did the things that I suggested them to do and it was doing very good. So I went to those teachers and I'm like, okay, give me feedback, please. Why is it? Because I would go, I'm like, hey, how's it doing with that online course? And they're like, oh yeah, 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 I I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Okay. Next time. 
how's it going? Because I, go, I would go to the online platform and I would look at the progress of my students, the teachers, and I'm like, okay, every module that I release to them, they start watching it and like the third video they stop or the second video they stop. And then after four fifth modules, they don't even open it. So, and then finally I got one of them, I stopped her and I said, okay, can we sit down and talk about this? I really want to know what's going on. Why do you not go through the course? And she's like, you know what? I really didn't want to tell you this because I love you so much and I love the work that you're doing and I don't want you to be discouraged and stop doing this. And I'm like, what? No, tell me. I like, there's no way I'm going to stop. Okay. So just tell me because I need to fix what was wrong with the course. And she's like, I don't have the time to do this. And I'm like, the reason my programs are working is because I actually um, solve this problem of not having time. I'm like, okay, so it's an in-school program. You, it's connected to the curriculum. You don't have to, you know, spend any more time that you already have to spend on your curriculum because it fits in, right? So there's no extra time. My school gardens are not touched by adults. It's all done by students. So there's no work on the, on the teacher's shoulders. No other adults have to do anything. No admin staff, no parent is required. It's all done, coordinated and supervised, obviously, by the teachers, but it's all done by the students. So it, that's why it was working, because the teachers didn't have to put any extra time on it. And she's like, I don't have the time. How do you expect me to learn about this through more than 12, like 13 hours of video? That like you're teaching me about what's permaculture and what's this. And I'm like, I knew this. I shouldn't have done that because I knew teachers are, are busy. That's why my program works like this, addressing their problems. And so anyway, that's, that's what happened with this. Something that really academically was praised didn't actually work in the real life for teachers. Um, so I thought I have two programs that are really, really, um, working. The, the shadowing program is working really well because they're there while I'm doing it. They see the practical, how to do it, how not to do it, what problems to avoid, what uh, bright lines to follow and all of that. And online is amazing because a lot of teachers do take courses online and they can do it at the convenience of their home. They really love that. And my uh, shorter workshop, online workshops, were working really well. So putting these two together, I came up with the idea of an online bootcamp program, which would, I'll tell you a little bit about it, which would work like this. So it's two to total of 12 weeks. My program is 10 weeks. So the first two weeks before we actually start the program, um, it's like how to avoid the common mistakes, what bright lines to follow, what material to order. And then at the beginning of the, the 10 weeks, you go like, this is your lesson plan. This is your shopping list. This is how you run this program for this week only. You do it at the end of the week. You come to a coaching call with me. If you have questions or anything, we're going to go through them. Next lesson plan, next shopping list, go. Next one, go. Next one, go. And we do this for 10 weeks. And it's online, so they don't need me to go physically in the school. They don't need to pay me those thousands of dollars to run those 40 hours of programming. They can do it themselves. All they need is an enthusiastic teacher who has internet connection. Okay, so that's my story. That's how I started and how, and this is where I um, got uh, at the moment. This is where I am at the moment. This is how the different ways that Kids Growing City can help teachers and schools um, and communities to actually make this happen. Um, so the first thing I want to ask you is, oh, I have this, by the way. Um, if you want to join my email list, if you can pass this around, thank you. Um, join my community, join my newsletter. There's a lot of free material that I send to teachers, which is really, really useful. Um, and the, this is the different ways that you can join me. So you can put your name and email in there, but you can also, so the bootcamp that's coming up this, um, spring, 
I mean, before this spring, obviously, um, because we want to get people registered in it so that we can start on time. It's a seasonal work, so it's it has there are deadlines that if you pass, you know, it's you have to wait another year. Um, so if if you go in there, kidsgrowingcity.ca slash boot dash camp dash notify dash me. <laughs> Bootcamp notify me. So when this goes live, I'm going to send you an email telling you it's live and you can join it if you want. Um, another way you can join me is um, I have, I have, so if you go to kissgrownsdy.ca slash healthy dash schools, I have a free report that I send you which tells you why most school gardens are not successful and or sustainable because sustainability is very important. There are school gardens that are popping up everywhere because parents know we want this, teachers want this. Like, it's not a debate anymore. This is not a debate. We all know that to raise healthy kids, we do need to include this into their, because it's not just about growing food. You all know that. Like, it's about connection to the natural origin of their food. It's about the peace and quiet and all the health benefits that a school garden can bring. It's a modern learning tool. You can teach math in it. You can teach anything you want in it. It connects to biology. It connects to, you know, we teach about soil and water and biodiversity. And there's a lot of good benefits, right? So, but that's why they're popping up everywhere. But the first year, everybody's excited and they, they go ahead and do it. They do it by one-time events or they do it with a club or, uh, or they, you know, spend a lot of money raising, I mean, building beds and things that are not necessarily necessary. And they do it wrong while they're actually running the program. And it becomes a lot of work for the teacher or for a parent. And then next year, they're like, they feel completely unappreciated. Uh, they're like, community didn't help me. It was all on my shoulders. The kids didn't learn anything because it was, all, it was all done all by adults other than those few times that they bring the kids in to take pictures, to, you know, give to their supporters and things like that, which is not the point of a school garden. We want to teach kids how to grow food. That's the main point. Um, and so it doesn't work. So it's not sustainable most of the time. So the first year it works, second year, whoever did it the first year, I gotta be like, I'm not gonna do that again because what's the point, right? So, um, so in that report, I tell you why this happens, what are the common mistakes that people do that you should be avoiding, and what bright lines to follow so that you're you're sure that this is going to work in your space. And then uh, this is a third way that you can join my 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 list and it's kidsgrowingcity.ca slash teachers dash seed dash starting. This is a free guide um, on how to start seeds indoors in a school environment. Um, school gardens are different than home gardens. Whatever you do at home to start seeds might be different than what you want to do in a school environment. So these are the three ways you can uh, join me and if you join my list obviously you're going to get more free material that comes um, uh, comes along as well as notifications about any online workshops those short workshops that works any you know anything else like my boot camp and all of that so um, I run as I told you 10 weeks on the ground um, I have teachers that go to schools and run my curriculum um, uh, there's a 10 weeks for spring and 10 weeks for fall. So if you are in the GTA, Greater Toronto Area, um, I can serve you like physically in your schools. Uh, I have online interactive workshops. I just ran a three-part uh, virtual school garden workshop, for example, uh, which was an interactive workshop. Teachers came in and then, then we, we so there were three different days three different hours presentations, which were recorded and I put it all into, with all the handouts and everything, into a course, online course format um, for people who want to join it and learn it um, later. And my upcoming virtual bootcamp class that I just told you. And that's essentially about it. That's, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Um, is there any questions, any specific burning questions that you guys want to ask and go for it. Sure. 
So um, thank you for your, for your for information. It's great to see how you're, you've sort of built your success from idea and the seed to fully, fully implemented. So with regards to the title, it says Best Practices for Sustainable Success for School Garden. What would your top two bright ideas for success in a school garden be? So I have a few bright lines, like five or six bright lines that you should follow in order to make sure that you're successful. Um, if I want, if I had to pick two of them, I would say start small. Don't go and build a huge project and then take it to your school board and they're like, whoa, there's no way you can do this. They're going to put obstacles after obstacles in your way because it gets them really afraid. So start small. Um, that's one. The other thing is, do this as an in-school program. I keep saying this to, to my teachers, and these are some of them are teachers who actually shadowed me and saw how it works as an in-school program, but then next year when they want to, they're trained and all that, next year they want to do it, they do it with a club. And I'm like, don't do it with a club. It's not going to work. Why is it not going to work? Because clubs are casual, right? They're like... Kids can join or not join. It's not like, it's not structured, right? Because what I do is that theory and practice. It's not just about going in the garden and planting the seeds. It's about knowing what seeds are. How do they germinate? What do they need? And to actually talk about what is, you know, hardening off. What is transplanting? You need to teach them about water and it's you know, about soil, about different types of soil. So it's theory and practice. And you can't do that with a club because clubs are like, it's supposed to be fun. It's a club. And sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. One day you get 40 kids, one day you get two kids. You know, so, and you can't force them to come. And it's it's a curriculum. So it follows, like one day is about seed, one day is about water, one, but one day is about soil. So, and you want all those kids and you want it to be in school and, you know, connected to, to the curriculum so that it has the impact that you want it to have. So, and there's, like, you guys are amazing. You are able to connect it to the curriculum because it connects so much. It connects with soil and water and biodiversity and health. And there's so many connections you can make. Um, don't put extra work in a club into it. It's not going to have the impact that you want it to have. Um, so, so that's your two bright points for, say, implementation and guidelines as you begin to go. So right. if you're looking at a more practical level, so I'm thinking school level, from a school that tried to do this, started last year, made it a club, it, I don't know, this is where you're right, I don't think the first, the teacher who started it is going to try to do it again next year because I know. they planted the wrong thing, they didn't yeah. get it out. So, at the implementation, if you're already embedded in that, what are some the two bright lights that might be a good consideration moving forward? We talked yesterday and you already said, well, they planted the wrong things, they didn't thin, and they didn't they didn't make a plan for the summer. So I showed up on the I showed up in the summer because my my talk said not to volunteer. All the carrots were bunched, all the beets were bunched. And the peas and the tomatoes were crammed together. So your first thing was, don't plant anything that needs to be harvested in the summer. You yeah. do fall, you do spring, things that the kids can plant and right. see and harvest at the right times. I mean, that's one thing that I will take back to the school. Look at how what you're planting and what it needs to be harvested. Right. That was a bright light. The other one, because I did, I wasn't there at the beginning. So the other one is plant, plant appropriate seeding. Issue. Right. I, I just work at gardening at home. Like so you know and, what's right and what's wrong. Yeah, so to see all, I don't know, they must have had the kids just scatter them. Right. And so all the radishes and the carrots were like this. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. Right. Like, I'm going to take them out. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm mean, those are two bright lights for me proper seasonal planting, right. proper um, ratio for seeds. Anything else? Like, I'm thinking of. So, so speaking, just, right, I'm right. Trying to take something that's already been. Right. Maybe started in the wrong process. Right. A few things about that. First of all, if you already have a club, keep the club. I'm not saying dismantle the club. 
the club can still help you with watering because that those one hours of per week that I spend teaching and actually doing the garden, like all the work in my school gardens in spring is done by the students in only 10 hours. And we teach them too, like it's actually half uh, theory, half practice, which means I teach in five hours of those 10 hours and all the work is done in five hours. So, but watering needs to happen every day. Watering is not something you can do, you know, once a week. So you can include your club in doing things like taking care of the garden, like watering and things like that. Um, you can even uh, invite them to become buddies. If your classroom, for example, is smaller children or um, DD children and they, they need buddies, they're garden buddies, you know, include your club into, you know, having garden buddies and things like that. Don't dismantle your club. It's amazing to have a gardening club. But your program has to be an in-school program that happens on a structured manner. So that's, so if you already have a club, keep it and use it. Uh, when it comes to what seeds to plant, so there are seeds you should completely avoid in a school garden because they are really difficult to grow. Broccoli is one of them. Um, do things that are easy to grow. And so there is this website. It's called growveg.com. It's, I'm not associated with them, but I think they have a seven day trial period that you can go in for free. They have a garden planner. It's called growveg.com. Let me see if I can go there. So they have a garden planner. So you register, you tell it, <coughs> this is I think a UK company, if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> where in the world you live. So it adjusts itself in terms of scheduling to your area of the world and your growing zone. Okay. So, and then when you go in, there is like, there is a design uh, pad, which you don't have to design. If you want, you can, you can actually even get your students to, you know, get excited about designing in there. But anyway, what the point is you can drag and drop the plants you want to grow. And then you go to the next tab and it gives you a complete schedule, color coded, of which seeds to start seeding indoors because like for places that we live in Canada you do want to extend your season to start indoors um, when you can actually plant them outside for every different plant and when can you expect to harvest so this will give you two things first of all um, which ones are short maturing because you want for kids you want quick results you want things that grow easily and fast so that it actually empowers them and gets them excited and gives them the idea that growing food is easy that's very very important and please don't tell anybody including your students or your kids growing food is hard because that is a myth it is entirely wrong it is not true growing food is not hard running a, <clears throat> a farm and having all the problems with money and you know business and all that is difficult. Uh, having an urban farm is difficult, but growing food itself is not a difficult thing. Uh, and you want to do it, you know, prove it to, to your students by picking the right seeds. Go with things that are, so if you look at that schedule, if you look at the beginning of the blue line, which is when you can start seeding, whatever, arugula, for example, indoors, <clears throat> until it gets to the beginning of the orange line, which is the one that uh, is when you can expect to harvest. If the difference is less than two months, that's what you want. Because that means from the time you seed it to the time you harvest it, it's only two months. So if you start in April, before the kids go home for summer, you get to harvest, right? So short maturing, easy to grow plants. Those are things like radishes spinach, leaf lettuce, arugula, mustard green. Those are things you want to have. I'm not saying don't do anything else, but I'm saying at least do those. And if you're doing something else, do those as well so that the kids don't have to wait the whole summer and then come back for a few tomatoes or a few, few um, cucumbers, for example. Those take long and during those times, they're not easy to grow. I don't know why everybody starts with tomatoes. I, I dislike growing tomatoes so much. 
they're not easy to grow. They're very finicky plants and they get all kinds of diseases and problems and cucumbers too, actually. So start with things that are easy to grow and are not problem problem prone and and they have short maturity time. Also, what that helps you is with is to see when it's going to get to fruit because you don't want your community to have to harvest or clean up after you during summertime, okay? You want watering to be the only thing that you get them involved and for that you want to match. So you want to grow things that kids harvest before summer or come back to to, to harvest seeds or food from in fall. And summertime is the only, the only thing that's needed during your summertime is getting the community engaged and excited about watering. And if you tell them that's the only thing you need to do, just water, and you put up a doodle thing, that's what we do in our schools, the ones that don't have a daycare, because you might even have a daycare that's happening during summertime or a summer camp program, and those guys can do it with their kids, which is amazing. So I have had schools that incorporated the watering into their summer camp program and the kids loved it and the <coughs> gardens flourished. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but if that's not the case and you want the parents volunteers or the community volunteers, you just put up a doodle and everybody goes in and puts in their time. I've had schools that we had so many volunteers that we didn't, we couldn't find spots for people to go in and water. So we said, you know what, then we're going to put a main person and a backup number one person and a backup number two person. We had so many people. And then we switched them around so that, you know, they all get to water. And it rained a lot this summer. So like at my own daughter's school, I was a parent volunteer, obviously, and I didn't get to water at all. Like whenever it was my turn, it was raining. And it happened a lot. Well, Two summers ago, it was the exact opposite, uh, but parents are really excited and they feel the responsibility and they're, they bring their child with them and then they do the watering. Oh, one thing very important, make the watering easy for your community during summertime. Very important. Like think about where your water access is and don't hide your garden. This, I'm telling you all the bright lines now. Um, don't hide your garden. Don't put it behind fences or behind walls. You want the community to see it on a daily basis when they come drop the kids or pick them up. They, they, you want, if you put it somewhere that the kids don't see and the parents don't see, it's not going to get attended to. It's going to be out of sight, out of mind. It will fail for sure. A lot of people put their garden, hide their gardens in anticipation of it failing. And guess what? That's exactly what makes it fail. Because you're thinking, oh, what if it looks ugly? What if the kids don't do anything with it? What if this, what if that? And how about we hide it so that it, if it looked ugly, the parents don't see it? No, that's exactly what you shouldn't do to make sure that it doesn't fail. Because if it's in everybody's faces, it gets attended to. That's another bright line. Don't hide your garden. Do it as an in-school program. Start with, start small. Start with seeds. Oh, start with seeds for your annual plants. I've seen a lot of school gardens. They go out and they purchase, pay a lot of money for that. Seedlings, you can't find, like it, where I am, it's really difficult to find organic seedlings. And if you do find them, they're triple the, 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 the money that you have to pay for it. But for seeds, you pay for 100 seeds, $2. You know, and if and you can find organic seeds. Like you go to Amazon.ca and there's organic seeds. Um, Canadian, actually, organic seeds that you can actually, you get it in two or three days. So seeds, start with seeds. Don't go spend money on uh, transplants. And when you start with seeds, if you... When you don't start with seeds, your children, your students will miss out on a huge important part of learning how to grow food. If you don't start with seeds, they're not going to learn about seeds, like hands-on. They're not going to see, they're not going to learn how to take care of seedlings. They're not going to learn about hardening off. Hardening off, if, in case you don't know what it is, it's like getting the seedlings used to the outside world outside weather, um, they're not going to learn about any of that. So all they get is a bunch of seeds, seedlings that somebody else created 
and they missed out on a huge part and it's much more expensive. So Starbucks seats is another great line. Um, you see, you, you, you ask one question and I go, please stop me whenever you think it's... <laughs> yeah. Does anybody here have their community garden or their school garden already going? Or is school people actually starting it? You, you do. It? How many already have one going? Okay. Any so, questions? Anything you want to... No, it's like you had been yelled and I was talking to my girlfriend the whole time. And I was like, you know, I think it's really important to So you love your tomatoes. I love my tomatoes and they were like awful and I was so sad about what was on the say and then we were talking about like doing it better this year and doing a whole inquiry into it and looking for those curriculum connections and all those pieces and talking about seeding but it's hard to seed in the school because we had someone come in and look at like hydroponics for seeds and then and I said but my like Nana does it at home in her third bedroom right like I don't think this is anything that we need to go high tech on because she's 82 and she's been doing this forever and she's not educated, right? So when you say that it's easy, it is, but it's all those other pieces. And for us, I think it's a mentality of a Winnipeg winter and Winnipeg permafrost still in May. But I, I just, I don't know, like my the light bulb will come from. Right, no, no, no. Um, so, so yeah, committees are really good. If you have a few teachers who are excited and interested about this, that's amazing. Get them to do this as an in-school program in their classrooms. Yeah. You have the support of the other teachers. That's amazing. That's what all my teachers crave for. And that's why, that's what they tell me. Like, I, I wish I had just one other teacher that would, you know, help me out with this, you know. So if you have that, hold on to it. It's really, really good. But, well, you got to get them educated about this and tell them this is a system that works. There are bright lines that if we follow, it's guaranteed that we will be successful and we will teach kids and it's an in-school program and it connects to your curriculum and all of that. So, so hold on to that, but, you know, use that to your, to your advantage in, you know, educating them and, you know, because they're already excited. Let's not lose the momentum on that. Yeah. And there are, yeah. So... There were a few things I wanted to tell you while, while you talked about this, but that was the first thing. How do you know what I wanted to tell you? Yeah, exactly. I've seen it so many times. So many times. it Yeah, it's an in-school program. You can connect it to your curriculum so easily. It's just fascinating how easy, easily it, it Actually, if you ask me, it has to be something that is taught. Like, it has to be part of the curriculum. It has to be its own thing, if you ask me. Just like math is, and just like art is. Gardening should be one, it, its own thing. Well, a, a girl can dream. We're, not, we're, nowhere, <laughs> we're nowhere close to that. But it already is kind of part of their curriculum. It's just that you need to find those connections and it's really easy to do. Yeah, and no, uh, that's another bright line, a very important one. Maybe I should have actually put it at the top. No adults touch the garden in a school garden. It is not your responsibility. You should never, ever do it. Nothing. Like if you are, if you have kindergarten students, and your space is in a way that you have no other way than having containers. And obviously, they can't build containers, right? But even building the garden, if it's in the ground, should be done by students. And if you're teaching a, a kindergarten class, make them make create buddy pro, a buddy program, a garden buddy program with a higher um, grade, so that those kids can actually, you know, uh, help move the soil and mulch and things like that to build the garden. Even building the garden should be done by the students. Everything else can be done by even kindergartners, like seeding and watering and all of that. So, yeah, if you do it that way, there's not going to be any teacher who gets burnt out 
or feels unappreciated, don't expect, do not expect any adult in the teachers, in the admin staff, caretakers, or parents community to take any responsibility. It has to be the case. And it'll work, I guarantee. If you do it this way, Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, don't hide it. Yeah, well, if it's there, it's there. Yeah, we, another principle is work with what you have. Right, work with what you have, though. Like, if you already have them uh, and it's going to be difficult to move them, you don't want that to become an obstacle, right? That's another thing. Uh, but uh, don't hide it. Put it somewhere that gets at least four hours of direct sunlight. What is direct sunlight? It is the sunlight that shines on the plant, okay? Because it, even if it's indoors, like when you're starting your seeds indoors in a school, do not put it in a north-facing window. Oh my God. I've seen, pe I've seen very, very smart people do that, actually. People who I have told them not to do it have done it. Because it's a school, there's so many things going on and you're busy and you know, so do not put it like, because what happens is that if the, your seeds don't get direct sunlight on them, they're gonna, it's called, they, they become leggy, they call it leggy. What happens is that they stretch their necks to look for the sun that they desperately need and they spend all their energy growing in one direction at a time that they should be um, spending their energy on growing their first set of leaves and their second set of leaves. So if you see your seedlings, um, you know, very close to the to the soil getting their seed, the, their first leaves, you're good. If you see them getting tall and having small leaves, that means they need sunlight, move them, or they will not work. Um, a north-facing window in the northern hemisphere get, gets not even one minute of direct sunlight. Because where's the sun? On the south, where whenever during the day it is, right? So you need sunlight that shines on your plants, your seedlings, at least for four hours. And if your garden's outside, again, four hours of direct, direct sunlight. Uh, put it close to water access. So now it gets complicated. Don't hide it in sunlight and water access. So you can bring water to your garden, but make sure water is broad and it's easy for your students because remember, you're not touching it. You're not even watering. No adults is going to do it. Don't create a situation with heavy watering cans that your little people have to carry long from the caretaker's office all the way to the garden. They're just, they're not going to do it. Simple, and it will fail. So you need to bring water to your garden, make it really easy for them to actually do the watering. Uh, you can use watering cans, but bring the hose to the garden with watering cans, and then they can fill up the watering cans and do the watering together. Um, so sunlight, don't hide it, water. Okay. okay. Any other questions? White lights, things you'd like to share? Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me. Please join me. I'll send you free stuff. I want. I really want this going on in every school. Every child deserves it. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.